Good evening. Nebraska's prison system has been in the news a lot in recent years. Before the recent escape of two prisoners, there were stories about prisoners being released too early and murders committed by a just-released prisoner. There's been overcrowding, assaults on prison staff, and a riot. But there have also been stories about new leadership, legislation aimed at reform, and efforts to move in new directions. That's the focus of this NET News special, Nebraska Prison Reform. I'm your host, Fred Knapp. Joining us for this discussion are Senator Les Seiler, Chair of the Judiciary Committee, Senator Kate Bowles, a member of the Appropriations Committee, and James Davis III, Deputy Public Counsel for Corrections, who handles inmates' complaints. Thank you all for coming. Nebraska Director of Correctional Services Scott Frakes had been scheduled to join us, but canceled after the prisoners escaped. I want to stop by, uh, start by asking each of you, based on your knowledge of the prison system, are these escapes isolated instances or are they representative of more systemic problems? Senator Seiler? Well, I think they are uh, re a recent occurrence. There's been a long time since uh, somebody has escaped from uh, Lincoln uh, Correctional Center. And, uh, but I think it's also an, uh, an indication of, of the problems that are caused by overcrowding. Senator Bowles? I would agree. I think they're a symptom of a stressed system. Okay. And James Davis? And I quite agree. It is a symptom of a stress system. And uh, you mentioned overcrowding. Uh, one, that's been a long-standing problem. The prisons hold more than 5,100 people when they were designed to hold fewer than 3,300. The number of prisoners is expected to go down when sentencing and reforms passed last year kick in, but for now, Prisons are still nearly 60% over design capacity. James, based on what inmates tell you and your observations of the system, what effect is this overcrowding having on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, let me try to put it in context so our audience can understand what we're talking about when we say overcrowding. So if you go to a single family dwelling and you have four living in there comfortably, then uh, you can meet your daily needs. Quality of life is great. But when you start packing like 12 to 16 in a single dwelling, then you stress. You stress your quality of life, services. And so in other words, uh, then you run into problems. And what that means in the correctional system is that you have problems in getting medication, programming, mental health, and other services that your quality of life would um, you know, just depend on. right th that you depend on. So, yeah. Senator Bowles, I think your district has a fair number of people who work in the prison system. What do you hear from staff about the effect of overcrowding? I hear a lot from staff. I hear uh, concern about their own personal safety. I hear concern about uh, training and experience and working with new staff members. Um, and I hear about the job satisfaction, frustration not only with the workload and the hours that are expected, but also with um, how they experience uh, the workplace culture and a lack of respect. Okay. Um, Senator Seiler, in your view, what are the legal risks if the state doesn't address overcrowding? Well, we've got some precedent in Texas and California where they were at about 160 percent overcrowded. And we're about that same level right now. And uh, they brought a federal lawsuit out there. And they uh, released uh, a number of really hardened criminals right out into the public. And so that's a real danger of happening. We've kind of had an agreement with the, uh, an informal agreement with uh, uh, the people looking over our shoulders that uh, if we continue to the move ACLU, forward. The ACLU, for example. For example. Uh, uh, Federal Department of Justice. Right. That if we keep moving forward with our programs to reduce that uh, level of overcrowdedness, they will, as long as we're trying to accomplish those things, uh, they will not bring their lawsuit. And um, is what you've already passed in terms of sentencing reform going to be enough, or do you have to do more? Well, I can tell you I was a guest speaker in Denver at a forum on, uh, on uh, overcrowding, and uh, uh, Georgia and Southern Cal or South Carolina was there. And uh, Georgia has had the program of 605 for five years. That's the bill that you passed last year That's that correct. reduced sentences and put an emphasis on... Uh, post-release post supervision. For minor offenses. Yeah. That's correct. And uh, they have closed three prisons in five years. 
and uh, South Carolina is just starting to see, they've had it for two years, and they're just starting to see their uh, population go down. Okay, all right. Um, in addition to overcrowding, uh, the, the prisons uh, suffer from a big staff turnover problem. Uh, last year, the turnover was 33%. Uh, it's supposed to have gone down a little bit this year, but uh, one of the reasons that's been given for that in a survey of staff is, is pay. Uh, James, you and I have talked about this. What's the situation as far as you understand it with people working for the state versus other places? Well, if you look at the county, the counties pay much more in their wages versus the state. That affects the state employee basically getting a low wage, working long hours, and sometimes working, uh, for example, if we look at Tecumseh, and they which work... Which is a state prison. Which is a state prison, which they work 12-hour shifts. So sometimes you could get that one employee to work two 12-hour shifts or 18 hours, and that's fatigue. And so when they fatigue, they tend to make mistakes because they're working long hours. Not only it's a security problem, but also causes family issues, too, at home because most of the time they're not at home taking care of their family or spending time with their significant other. So it has a big effect when we work these employees for a long periods of time and they're underpaid. It's a security problem inside the institution and also to the public. Um, Senator Bowles, you're on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, it's, it sounds like it would cost a lot of money to deal with this problem. What, what's the appetite for doing that in your estimation? And what's the state's capacity to, to throw more money at the problem? Well, I think there are multiple solutions. One solution comes through the negotiations process with the public union. Um, and I think that's one of the responsibilities of our governor to understand what the needs are and to bring ideas to the table and to make the appropriate ask of the appropriations committee. I think in the meantime, there are strategies that we can use to make the facilities more civil, um, ranging from you know, maybe instituting a support line for the corrections officers that have had a hard time to uh, making sure that there are programs available to keep the inmates uh, more occupied and therefore calmer. So I, th I think we need to come at it from multiple angles. Okay. Um, Senator Shiloh, these are union-represented uh, employees, and if you change the uh, pay for uh, people in one bargaining unit, there's going to be pressure to do that across the board. Every penny, uh, every percent uh, raise for existing employees costs about $4 million. This is going to cost a boatload of money. Don't you think that uh, uh, there's going to be resistance to that? I'm not sure there's going to be resistance. If you remember this last session, we uh, put in a $1.5 million extra beyond what they asked for uh, for uh, compensation. And so I, th I think that that's uh, uh, an indication that the senators are willing to work on this problem. This is not a problem that just came up this year. This is a problem that's been festering for about 20 years. And so they we're not going to solve it overnight, but we can make a big chip away at the program and get it back on, online. The, the bad part right now is if you go to work today uh, for the prison system, uh, you get about $15.30, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're making the same as a guy that's been there for 10 years. And that, that's not a way to run a, a business. And this is a business. And so, yes, it's going to take some money to make some of these corrections. But if we can stop that turnover rate and the training rate, you, you figure the turnover rate causes you to have more new people coming in and training them, and that costs a lot of money too. And so you could do away with that training uh, program uh, or cut it back considerably. And th that savings you could use for salary. If you're just joining us, this is an NET News special, Nebraska Prison Reform. My guests are State Senators Les Seiler and Kate Bowles, members of the Special Legislative uh, Prison Oversight Committee, and James Davis III, Deputy Ombudsman for Corrections. If you missed part of this program or want to see it again, it'll be on our website, netnebraska.org news. You know, we were talking about staff turnover. Another thing that keeps people from wanting to work in prisons is assault by inmates. 
There was a spike in assaults recently. They rose from 78 in 2013 to 143 last year, and they were on pace in the first four months of this year to top 180. Director Frake says they've since gone down. But um, Senator Bowles, uh, what concerns do you hear from uh, prison staff about that level of assaults? To the Department of Corrections credit, they are at least reporting those, and there's some transparency there. But I think the heart of the problem is lack of experience. What I hear from the folks that I'm talking to on doorsteps and that call my office are that working with an inexperienced staff member is something that can put someone at real risk. Hmm. Uh, James Davis, based on your interaction with inmates, what's your perception about this, this recent increase in assaults? Well, basically, like uh, Senator um, Bo said, there's a lack of uh, staff experience and then also uh, having the staff work double overtime. So there you create a problem between the inmate and the staff member. If the staff member is stressed, then basically he may say something incorrect to the inmate and then the inmate may interpret that the wrong way. And so you may have a conflict there. And of course, and, the inmates are stressed because and it's stressed too. And then basically, if they, especially if they're on restrictive housing, where they are confined for 23 hours in a day, and and you don't have any programming, the out of cell time is limited, and also the mental health down there in restrictive housing is barely happening. So, and then when the staff has to go down there and perform his duties like uh, uh, laundry, phone, showers, yard. Many times they're short. So then they're gonna be short with the inmate because they don't feel that the inmate is moving fast. But the inmate want a little extra time of itself. So if he walks down to the shower, if he walks down to the law library, or if he requests his commissary and the staff act inappropriately or says something inappropriately to that inmate, then you have a conflict. I just want to say one thing about the 1.5. I just want to bring that back real quick. That's the 1.5 million that Senator Sider right, correct. mentioned that was Basically, appropriated to yes. try to retain staff. Right. Our office would like to know uh, whether or not the director has implemented that as far as uh, bonuses for the staff. That would help them tremendously. Uh, the 1.5 and also the 1.8 million for spacing, uh, for uh, additional spacing to relieve some of the overcrowding in the system would also help uh, in those type of things. So I just want to just bring that back to your attention and then go back to how that uh, inmate to staff uh, relationship works. It's not always just uh, uh, inmate acting out, is how sometimes staff come to the inmate. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I, I might add, if I could, that we're also learning that there is a significant uh, amount of serious activity happening, and there are a number of ways to articulate that, but gang activity or organized activity, um, and that that's increasing concerns about safety, as well as uh, if, if as some of the good work that the Judiciary Committee has done to make sure that, that only the, the most violent or, or most extreme folks end up in the correctional system, that makes our population within the system uh, more difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. And uh, James mentioned uh, the availability of mental health services. I know that's been a focus for you. Mm -hmm. What's your perception of the uh, adequacy of, of mm -hmm. those services and the availability for people who really need it? Mm -hmm. It's a big concern for me. Uh, I just asked for the statistics prior to the show and the staff to inmate ratio for inmates who have a mental illness diagnosis is concerning, um, as high as 110 to 1 at the Tecumseh State Correctional Facility, more reasonable in places like the Diagnostic and Evaluation Center, which is 34 to 1. Um, but that's where a population of folks with uh, the need for diagnosis and the need for front end services and supports is, is most prevalent. So I think it's an ongoing issue. Something else I would add is that 82% of the population as a whole has some mental health diagnosis, and two to 4% of the population has a severe or extreme diagnosis that needs significant medical attention. So it's an area that um, we've all paid attention to, but a difficulty uh, that the Department of Corrections is facing is the ability to recruit and retain the appropriate medical staff in that area. 
Right, because it's a problem all across the country, a shortage of mental health professionals, especially in rural areas. Right. Senator Cyril, you've talked a lot about how, in your view, the prisons have become sort of a dumping ground for people with mental health problems. Mm -hmm. How can that situation be changed? We had a hearing this morning on that very issue, and uh, it was pretty much agreed by the uh, people who are out there on the front line that that is becoming a, a real problem in that uh, when they pick somebody up, they don't have any hospitals to take them to. There's no um, what we call EPC or emergency protective care uh, centers uh, that have openings. So what they do is uh, one of the county attorneys talked about it this morning. They charge him with a criminal offense. And I ask him if a person goes through the criminal uh, system a couple times what happens and he says their sentences get a lot longer. Well, that's how they end up in our prison system and uh, So how do you how do you address that? It sounds like you address uh, that before anybody gets to the prison the, system in yeah, the first Absolutely, time. what we need to concentrate on and I've been proposing this for five years that we set up a, uh, a um, uh, EPC system and uh, uh, and I recommended Hastings uh, and, and a holding area where they could program them so that they just don't turn them loose after uh, uh, seven days and let them back on the street. But they have to ha actually move them to a, uh, a programming system where they were would receive psychiatric and uh, mental health uh, programming to help them get stabilized. And then we've got a real good system of regions that have community housing for them. But we don't have that intermediate step. So they're ending up going to the jail system instead. We've got to stop that. And, and James, what, what do people that are in the system say about the availability of services and would they use them if they were available? Um, from my perspective and for the viewers, I usually go down to the cells where those individuals are that need uh, treatment. They would use the services if it was available. Uh, many of the services aren't available, so a lot of those guys sit there and deteriorate. In, uh, in general population or in restrictive housing. And so uh, there are not a lot of clinicians. Um, if we take a point, um, we look at Tecumseh, where it was lacking mental health services in the restrictive housing. When I say restrictive housing, meaning solitary confinement. Those guys were not getting the services that they need. So therefore they would deteriorate and act out. Um, so we, the department constituted a mental health unit. Dr. Gage from Washington came down, who is a psychiatrist, came and looked at that system. And uh, usually the national average is 17% of people in our system need mental health services. Well, Nebraska, in our system, they said we only can um, find two to three percent which is a low number. That sounds like what Senator Bowles was saying was the number for people with what they considered serious mental That's health right. problems. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that nationally it's 17% it's that, that needed, need the service. Correct. And then also in our system, we have individuals who have problematic behaviors and basically there's no services for them. In other words, you may have a mental health unit that looks at I don't want to get in the mention of words, serious mental illness, but mental illness, and they get that service, but those who have problematic behavior are not being treated, so therefore they're being placed in segregation where they also deteriorate. We also have a problem so where... So rather than getting treated, they're being locked away. Correct. Okay. And then we have those who should be at the regional center, and the regional center aren't really addressing those issues, who have serious mental illness, or on the O axis one system, schizophrenic, bipolar, those type of individuals that should be at the regional center aren't getting access to those beds. Senator Seiler, the legislature passed a law last year aimed at reducing the use of restrictive housing. Um, what, what was the thinking behind that? The studies from Colorado, which are probably leading the nation right now, and we had the lady that ran that program come to uh, Lincoln and, and testify before our Judiciary Committee, pretty much stated that uh, the patient that goes to uh, restrictive housing gets worse than, rather than better. And so they've said short-term uh, programs in the uh, 
restrictive housing is more effective than a long term. Mm. Okay. And a perfect example, I think, is Nico Jenkins. What was he in there three years in solid uh, uh, special uh, housing? Uh, so, I, you know, they're they're finding by research that it's better to have short term and immediate uh, uh, restricted housing rather than put them in there and leave them there for two or three years. He was the inmate that I referred to at the start of the program who was released out of uh, restrictive housing and uh, was convicted or pled guilty to, didn't plead guilty, what was it, no contest? Uh, he's, I think he's sitting on a plea that uh, he's claiming mental illness. But there's... Uh, and the judge is having him examined right now and the reports before the judge. Right, but he killed four people he did. within a month of... And he jammed out. He did not uh, uh, be released by the uh, prison people. He was actually served every day of his sentence. Right, as opposed to being paroled. Right. And and Senator Bowles, you've pushed to make the department, uh, the the uh, uh, parole board, independent of the Department of Corrections. Why is that important? Mm -hmm. It's important for a number of reasons. First is that we saw the reentry furlough program a couple of years ago, which inappropriately let out a number of violent um, individuals. And if you recall, some of those individuals had to be brought back into the correctional system. And some of that was due to a variety of stresses and pressures on the Board of Parole. By making the Board of Parole an independent entity, uh, they can be more focused on their independent decision making, but we also put additional resources into that system so that they can have evidence-based practices, so that they can have the staff that they need, and so that they can provide the proper uh, evaluation of the systems and supports that they're purchasing uh, for the parolees. I know uh, Director Frakes has talked about the importance of evidence-based approaches. Um, even in terms of the programs that inmates uh, have access to, you know, violence reduction, that sort of thing. Um, and he's made the point that up until now, we've had these programs, but there isn't really much of a study of whether they work or not. So I think that's one change that's in the works. Speaking of those programs, James uh, Davis, you've, you've talked about bottlenecking uh, in getting access to the programs that people need to be eligible for parole. Can you talk about that a little bit? And you used an analogy of a math class or something. To... Well, what we're talking about bottlenecking is trying to get access to the programs. Um, basically, when you come into the system, you are evaluated and then you are, are, are uh, designated to take certain programs. And for the viewer, We'll talk about balance reduction. A balance reduction is more of like a Cadillac program where you only have 24 beds for approximately a, a large segment of your population. So therefore, when they go through that process, they can't get access to that program because you have too few beds. So in the end run, we're looking at inmates or offenders closer to their TRD when they're going to jam. What's TRD? Uh, that's when they jam out, get out into, you know, get ready, return back into the community, that um, then it pops up that they need to take the VRP. Well, violence, re violence reduction. I am so sorry. <laughs> violence reduction or anger management. So it's a Cadillac program. At one point in time, it was a two year. Then they knock it down to a 12 months. And then now we're looking at nine months and it's going down to six months. But at that particular time, a lot of inmates could not get access to that program. So they were, were placed on a waiting list. So they had to wait for a very long time to get access to that program. By the time they were ready to terminate from prison, they didn't want to take the program because basically it, it was not enough time. And then also it affects the parole board decision because when they go before the parole board and they don't take the program, then the parole board also deferred them to jam. So that's what I call bottlenecking the system. You just didn't have enough program to provide for those individuals. And then another thing is that those VRP programs were not evidence-based. So we don't know whether or not um, they were working because we didn't keep the numbers on them. Yeah. So now also the sex offender programs, which is the I help program, which is one of their 
Cadillac programs. We never kept numbers on that also. Sounds like you're saying we need fewer Cadillacs and more bicycles and <laughs> Fords and Chevys right. in order to, okay. Um, Senator Seiler, uh, do you think that the state is eventually gonna have to bite the bullet and build a new prison or, uh, or is the sentencing reforms and things that have already been put into the works gonna avoid that need? I think that there's no doubt that if we stay with the program that we set up in uh, LB 605 and LB 1094, uh, we will come down. The statistics are already starting to show small reductions uh, in prison, but uh, uh, Omaha and Lincoln uh, judges are, have told me that they're running uh, behind on their uh, sentencing, and so the, those reduced sentences that we passed a few years ago haven't really started coming through the system yet. Okay, so when once the big population counties start reducing sentences, then hopefully this trend will continue. Absolutely. Okay. I, I think the last number I heard was the master program that was designed, and it was something like $519 million to build a prison. Yeah, or that's a not series to, of them. That's yeah. not to run it. That's to, 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 build, it. to build it, to get it up to... to uh, uh, where they think it has to be to beat the federal guidelines. Okay. That's a terrible amount of money. That's a hefty chunk of the state budget. Um, we only have a few minutes, uh, maybe a, a minute and a half left, so uh, in 30 seconds or so, I'd like to ask each of you, should Nebraskans feel uh, good about where their prison system is? Have we turned the corner? Are we headed in the right direction? Or is there more bad news to come before that happens? James? Uh, from my perspective, we've, we, we got a long way to go. Uh, we still have to look at the restrictive housing, one of the major things that I was working on. Uh, we created a new policy on that, the department did, but I, I think it's still the same thing, so we have a long way to go. Senator Bowles? I think we've made some great progress. I think the attention has resulted in significant policy change, but without new investments and new strategies for addressing our staff issues, we won't be able to make progress. All right. Well, that's, I'm afraid, Senator Seiler, we're not going to be able to get a final word from you unless you have it in five seconds. Okay, I'll take five seconds. I think the program is well grounded, and if followed, uh, we'll, we'll come out on the other end of this. Very good, sir. All right, we'll have to end the conversation there, but I'm sure there'll be a lot more news about prisons in the months ahead. This has been an NET News special, Nebraska Prison Reform. Thanks again to our guests, Senators Les Seiler and Kate Bowles, James Davis III, Deputy Ombudsman for Corrections. You can see this program again on our website, netnebraska.org news. I'm Fred Knapp of NET News. Thanks for joining us.